This time on Poll Hub, Brett Kavanaugh's nomination to the Supreme Court has already been the most politicized in history. But whether confirmed or not, how will it impact the midterm elections just a month away? Our new poll numbers are showing the nomination is making a difference. We're going to talk about it. We're also going to dive into the pollster debate. That sounds exciting. About a recent New Jersey poll. And then waiting for education, not waiting for Godot education. I like that waiting, like the wait. This is not an academic issue because some big names in polling have been arguing for using people's educational attainment as a way to make polls more accurate. Well, we decided to test out that thesis. And we have some data to discuss. Let's get busy. And hi, everybody. Welcome to Poll Hub. I'm J.D. Dapper, Director of Innovation here at the Marist Poll. And I'm Barbara Carvalho, Director of the Marist Poll. And I'm Lee Marigoff, Director of the Marist Institute for Public Opinion. As we uh, record this podcast, uh, the FBI has returned its report on Brett Kavanaugh. The senators have read it. Uh, And just as it seemed last week and the week before and the week before that, it does seem, as we sit here, fairly likely right now that Brett Kavanaugh is going to be confirmed um, by the Senate by some vote. We don't know that, but it does seem fairly likely. But we've been in the field asking some questions about this to the American public, and the political impact does seem to have changed. Yeah, one of the things that we've seen, and and it's really been going on this week, and I think we're going to see it in other polls that are going to come out from different organizations, that there has been a growing enthusiasm on the part of Republican voters. I think if anything has happened as a result of this, it's that the base of the Republicans have now said, wow, there's a midterm election coming up and we may want to join it after all. It's not that the Democrats have gotten turned off to the process. They're really there and they have been. It's that the Republicans have now suddenly awakened. I think the numbers are now only a two-point difference in favor of the Democrats, whereas recently we had, I believe, a 10-point difference. So the hearings have had an impact, and I think it's mostly about the Republican base. Not an insignificant change, but one that's important is it longstanding? Will there be another issue sh- shows up next week? Well, that's anybody's guess. We certainly have had a lot of news cycles coming and going really quickly. Well, I think what this issue and the whole uh, hearing and the testimony of uh, Dr. Ford and Judge Kavanaugh uh, really politicized the whole issue of the Supreme Court. And the uh, partisans lined up on either side, and it became very intense, just like many of the other um, issues when they have come to the fore, uh, whether it be about immigration or guns um, or about um, the the issue of um, race. So this definitely became a a very heightened partisan issue. And regardless of whether uh, Judge Kavanaugh is confirmed or not, I think it has become a motivating factor um, on either side. It does play out differently depending upon the result of the of the vote. I think that... I mean, that's one of the things I'm thinking about. Let's say he gets confirmed. Right. What happens to Democrats and what happens to Republicans now that the page gets turned and we move on to something else? What what's the? I mean, my my sense sense of it is that this had become a a very strong motivating factor for Republicans, thinking that again the um, Democrats were you know were thwarting their ability to get someone you know uh, to get Trump's pick on the Supreme Court, um, and it became very very partisan. Um, Certainly, you know, Judge Kavanaugh's, uh, you know, testimony, um, you know, played into into that and creating that kind of a dynamic. But but I think, does that go away? But but I think I I think that it may somewhat dissipate if, in fact, he's confirmed, because, again, you get the the win and you get the win and you you become more complacent. And one thing we have learned over the last several years uh, with with the Trump you know, presidency with the Trump candidacy and all these wave elections that, um, you know, fear is a motivator, anxiety, hate in some instances is much more a powerful motivator uh, than if you so, think that you are so winning the political right, one battle. Thing that, that stood out when I'm looking at our poll results and we haven't given you any numbers and uh, you, there, you basically there's two numbers I want to give you and, and then discuss. 
um, the, who do you believe, we asked, do you believe Dr. Ford, do you believe uh, Brett Kavanaugh? 33% said they believe Brett Kavanaugh, 45% said they believed Dr. Ford. That's a big difference. It's a 12-point gap there. Yet, uh, is Kavanaugh a, nominating, a nomination uh, voting issue? The intensity there, the enthusiasm for that it did not seem to be as high to reflect that. So 40% of registered voters um, say that they're more likely to support a candidate who opposes the nomination. 31% say uh, they're more likely to support a candidate who favors the nomination. 26% said it made no difference. So while she's more believed, it doesn't necessarily translate, at least when we polled, into I care about it as a voting issue. Although those who do seem to go, at least in a national way, on her side, the Democratic side in this case, not on the Republican side. Of course, how that plays out in red states is, is something you know that we can't tell from these numbers. I am struck by the, the question of, you know, what will the Republican argument be after this? Is it stronger to say we delivered what we said we were going to do, or is it better for the Republicans to say the Democrats tied this up in knots and we have to can't elect any Democrats because then, in other words, is is that negative factor going to be more a motivator coming out of this? And I think one of the things I'm also struck by in the political atmospherics of this, which is obviously the midterms is what is right over over the horizon there, is what was going on in Capitol Hill, which Americans really watched, but also what was going on in the White House. Donald Trump, until the speech in Mississippi just the other day, pretty much said, you know, she's credible. I'm not going to get excited about this. I'm not tweeting this. And that tends to make the GOP stronger when he's not really on his Twitter horse. And does that now end? And does he get back into, as he did in, in Mississippi since the poll, does that now become part of the political give and take again in the closing four and a half weeks? Well, you know, also we tend to, to look um, in off-year elections at the base, the Democratic base, and also the Republican base. But what we're seeing in 2016 is, in fact, I mean, sorry, 2018, is that it may be more like a presidential turnout election. And that does change the dynamic a bit, because the take the believability question that you mentioned, Jay, uh, when we look at partisanship, well, 76% of Democrats believe Ford, and the identical proportion yeah, of Republicans, 76% yeah. believed Kavanaugh. But independents believed Ford. And so the issue is, even in red states, um, where you have you know more Republicans than Democrats, you do have this group of voters, independents, who do determine who ends up, you know, um, taking taking the oath of office. And I think on this particular issue, um, independents were siding on the or and leaning they, and they Democratic be, uh, as opposed to Republican. And, that and so that was a big that was a big issue day that uh, that we're going to really be zeroing out. There's one thing in this poll, though, I, I just want to talk about, which is a little bit different than the, you know, who's favorable, who's unfavorable, and what this means for the midterms coming up. And that was the comparisons to questions that were asked in 1991 during the Anita Hill, Clarence Thomas um, d debate. You know, we've talked in here about how we rely on the Roper Center, and this is a good instance on their archives and providing information. And what I found absolutely fascinating in these numbers was that this was a very different reaction to this testimony where the accuser was much more believable than it was in 1991 when after that confirmation battle Anita Hill was not seen in a good light whereas Clarence Thomas's numbers had improved 56% in 1991 in a CBS News New York Times poll mm -hmm. 56% thought that he should be confirmed Clarence Thomas and he was and 35% said he should not be. Yeah, and now it's pretty not quite the opposite, but it certainly goes in the opposite direction. And in the case 1991, it went more in Thomas's favor, whereas now it went 
less than Kavanaugh's favor as a result of all the publicity. So there is something going on in the culture that has permeated the reaction to this kind of give and take in the confirmation process. One I thought that was really One other thing to, to, to uh, also uh, just point out something that I thought was very interesting um, in this poll, which we haven't discussed, is we've, we've heard a lot about uh, the gender gap and how men and women are looking um, at candidates and these issues uh, through a very different lens. I think one of the things that we saw in this polling is even beyond gender, what is important is partisanship. When we looked at Democrats, it really didn't matter. Uh, there was real no real difference between men and women. When we looked at Republicans, there was no real difference between men and women. There was a difference among independents, and that's really the only place we saw um, a difference in opinion between uh, between men and women. So there's there's an undercurrent um, of partisanship that I think is very strong and is going to be very telling. So let's switch gears and talk about uh, the Garden State of New Jersey. And interesting because uh, this is should be the safest of safe seats for the Democrats holding a Senate seat, Bob Menendez. Now he had some legal problems and was on trial, but the uh, hung jury, he gets out of that. Uh, and a new poll came out uh, from Stockton University, the Stockton University poll, and it showed it to be a very close race, which was not necessarily in line with some other polls. And um, there was a bit of a firestorm that came out of that. Let's yeah. talk about that. Yeah, several things came up as a result of that, and, and, and people did jump <laughs> when they saw these numbers. Uh, you know, this may be a case of a broken watch telling the right time twice a day because – the numbers may suggest, in fact, it is a close race, maybe not as close as the Stockton poll is showing, but it raised not so much that as, because it looks like maybe a single-digit race, they have it at two points. They have it at uh, two, and yeah. nobody else has yeah, it. Yeah, everybody has, yeah. but there's fives and sixes out there, so it's not like night and day in terms of the numbers, but it does suggest some things that were going under, on, under the hood. Uh, first off, Stockton does not belong, I understand, to the American Association of Public Opinion Research Transparency Initiative. So a lot of this, and this is my understanding, that a lot of this is sort of dug out from their release as opposed to them being uh, perhaps as forthcoming. Well, right. So well, what's I the, did, what was I the did complaint? Connect. You, you yeah, talked. I mean, okay. I, did, yeah. I did connect with so them. what's and the, the issue? The, well, Why but the was issue there a here, The issue here was that uh, they came out with a two-point um, lead, mm -hmm. which was statistically not a lead, uh, so that you're for looking Menendez. For, for Menendez. Menendez. Yeah. Um, so uh, although they they had him numerically ahead, they were they were saying that this is a this is a race that um, although New Jersey is a blue state and the expectation is that the Democrats will hold that seat, which is obviously very crucial um, to determining uh, who is going to have the majority in the Senate. Um, it, it it raised a lot of eyebrows, particularly on the Democratic side, but. But I think what caused the biggest controversy was that uh, Patrick Murray, who runs the Monmouth uh, poll, the Monmouth University poll. Also in New Jersey. Also in New Jersey, um, questioned, questioned the sample that they had released. And they released um, their unweighted numbers, which means the, the numbers they got from um, just calling and interviewing people before they use their special sauce and before they balance it uh, to um, the population and what it should look like. And his concern was that they hadn't interviewed enough people, you know, young people, people under 30, that they got a very low proportion. And so if they were going to uh, then use weights to increase the, represent the representativeness of that group in their sample, they were going to be weighting them a lot, um, and they might be different. And then uh, the people who they spoke with are compared to other people that they didn't and providing some kind of bias or skew. And there were a number of things like that in their unweighted numbers where um, uh, Patrick was, was pretty much saying, I've never gotten that. Um, so 
I, I did I did reach out uh, to the folks at Stockton. I think we have an investigative reporter on our hands. <laughs> well, you know, and, and Lee, you but make the a director, really good... he emailed back to you. Yeah, and, and you make a good point, Lee, about the transparency initiative uh, that uh, our professional association um, has started. And what that allows is um, if you're publishing all of this information, you are then able to compare polls across a number of factors, and then it can enlighten things. Things. And so, although they are not part of the transparency initiative, they were very forthcoming in terms of what their methodology is. And so, they have been doing polling since 2012. They've done a number of elections, both statewide and locally. They do their local uh, CD uh, in New Jersey as well. Um, and it does um, it does appear that it is an educational program at the school in the sense that they have their own phoning center and um, the students. Students are very much involved uh, in doing the interviewing. And it was suggested that they weren't making a solid attempt at being um, a scientific poll. And in that instance, I, I, would, I would disagree. Because as, we, we, as I did drill down, um, they, although some of the things are not exactly how we would approach um, our sample, for instance, they drew their sample 55% um, from um, a, register, a registration-based sample, which means from a registered voter list, and 45% of their sample was um, random digit dial. Um, you know, we've, because there are coverage issues with registration registered base, as we have discussed. So they were trying to make up for that, um, which other other scientific sure. polls Absolutely. have attempted to, to use that methodology as well. Um, and then they also use pretty standard questions in developing their likely voter model. It was a cutoff model. So what that means is um, people were asked um, on a scale of, you know, zero to 10 to rate themselves about how likely um, they would, they would, um, uh, they were to vote, um, how interested they were in the race, and they were asked an old Gallup question, which was to identify their polling place. And so there was this attempt to kind of identify people which who does, were... doesn't work for early voting. Yeah, <laughs> well, there, there are some issues, and certainly Gallup's no longer yeah. in this kind of election forecasting business, yes. so um, it does it does speak to how how their model has, had, so, has so done. So bottom line, was the criticism fair, a little over the top? What do you think? I think I think, I think the criticism was a little over the top um, because I think that this was an, uh, an academic and scientific effort to, to measure what is going on. Um, I do see reasons why they would have had uh, difficulty and this may have um, emphasized the, um, the dissatisfaction with Menendez just in terms of their sampling. Um, but I, I don't think that... Um, the, the issues that were pointed out in terms of the sample, yes, that they were um, underrepresenting certain yes, groups in their unweighted number. This was not in the number I that they then um, that they based the, the two point results on. Um, but that can also be um, a lack of skilled interviewers and the fact that they are using students, it's early in the semester, they may not have been you know as well trained. And New Jersey is one of the, the toughest to states to, to poll and to interview. Uh, our interviewers end up probably answering more questions about who we are, who's doing the poll, who's How paying you got my for number. it, um, uh, before okay. they even get to let, ask let just, one. Let me just make one additional point here, because you know one of the things I found interesting was that in their likely voter model, they had so many people... Uh, as in their almost nearly as many as in their potential electorate. So they really didn't filter down to a, a large number. However, as we've seen in our other polls, the likely voter models may not be all that different this time than the registered models. And that may be a case of a broken watch telling the right time twice a day also. Well, but let me, let me come jump one other point here in, in that in undersampling a critical group like sure. young people, I think the point needs to be made that then when they weighed it, each of those individuals they did reach is going to count a lot 
Right. And, and we saw that in the presidential election. So, for election. instance, so, yes. so the example in this poll was they got um, uh, 4% of their sample was uh, people under, under 30. 30. Right. And so we know that it's their people under 30 are probably going to be somewhere between 12 and 16% yes. of the electorate. So that means you're now multiplying By three or four. those people three or four times. Now, we times. know from the last presidential election that there was that poll out in, uh, uh, I think it was USC, uh, did poll yes, the panel poll. The panel poll, and they had a few African Americans. I think one African American in Indiana who happened to be uh, a Trump person. So they were running a high African American support for Trump because of this very problem. It yes. didn't turn out there. No question. One last point on this, and, I, and then we can move on. If there is an upset here, and Menendez does lose for the Democrats chances of picking up the majority in the Senate, that's probably game, set, match. I mean, I think that would be next to impossible for them. That's why New Jersey is so critical. So uh, one other thing um, we've talked about before, and we just wanted to come back and circle back on it. When we uh, take, uh, when we get poll results, one of the things we do is we uh, make sure that we weight it so that it looks like the general population. It's a we, weighty discussion a today. Way- We're having a lot of weighty discussion. <laughs> May have to we go are. on a diet. After yeah, this, this is this is the diet episode, episode sixty-three, the diet episode of Pull Up. <laughs> So when we weight that sample, um, and we yeah, use and the census, reason for the yep. reason for that is because <laughs> um, it actually has to do with response patterns and people being either more or less difficult to get an, get a hold of. Like we just talked about with the Stockton poll exactly. and having fewer people under certain age, mm-hmm. it's, you're more likely to reach other groups. So anyway, this is not you know some kind of crazy you know, witch's brew kind of thing. This is science. And so what we do is we look at the Census Bureau data, the hard data, and we wait for that. So in 2016, there were all, a bunch of people, but one in particular, pollster, said, hey, you know what we ought to do? We didn't get six. Some people didn't get 16, right? We did. But some people didn't get nationals in 2016, right, or states. And we said, if we had just gone and waited by education, which is not in the census figures, right? Uh, it is in the American Community it, Survey. So we do right. have a population parameter for that. Yeah, that's and the and, in the, and in the census, I think the difficulty is that education is really collected for people 25 and older. And our samples are for voters. So for voters. it's 18 plus. So, so it, does, plus. it does get, leave, you know, some what we call the fancy word is imputing, which means you kind You're of guessing. have to figure out. What so you doing. made the point at the time, though, that, hey, we probably don't need to do that because we wait by income, which correlates well with education. Mm-hmm. And our, if you just do a good job on in, in income, you get the right answer. So, but you've tested this. Yeah, We've Bar- now tested yeah, it. Barb's going to point out the numbers in a second, but I want to point out that this, from our vantage point, this after the election fact was sort of like Monday morning quarterbacking. It was a you know let's fight the last war recommendation. It was a you know you know we can now retrofit our poll into right. these numbers if we had done that. And you know, so I, we tested the thesis. Yes. That's my point. And, we're, and we actually, tested. we're continuing to. And so what are we finding? As as we as we continue, we have not changed our we have not changed our model. Um, Notice how Barb's being a little suspenseful here. Like <laughs> I, I feel like a drum roll might be more, in ca- but I don't have. You my didn't sound bring your machine. sound machine. I do not have Thank that goodness. with me, so we're stuck with the build up. And and what is the result of this? Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Psh. Not much difference. <laughs> so it was very important to have the build up because um, because because the basically was really because dramatic, the, the issue thought. is there is a very strong um, relationship between education and income. And I think we've talked about this in the past where um, pollsters stopped uh, waiting by income probably, you know, a, a decade ago because it was difficult for to, get it. to, to have people respond uh, in an informed way. There was a very high uh, non-response to the question of income, and they felt that it just it didn't wasn't it dependable. didn't show as much. It well, it dependable. wasn't as valuable because yeah. there was too much missing information. But instead of kind of throwing the baby out with the bath, um, what we did was we um, added a number of questions, follow-up questions, so that if you didn't want to a- answer the detailed um, income question, we asked the question in smaller and smaller categories. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm sorry, larger and larger categories, I should say. So it's going we started by what's your income and ended up at do you make more or less than 100 grand a year or something like exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. So okay. that we can still so that we can still create um, a, 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 a 
we can still use it to balance the sample to what okay. we know the population I, looks I buy like. that. And so when we did that, um, our refusal rates are... N- no different than what it would be if we were asking people about education, which we also do. We just don't wait by education. So in our last um, uh, states with um, NBC News, uh, we, we looked at um, Missouri, Tennessee, and Indiana, and we took those states and we used our um, regular model, our uh, proven model uh, of waiting, and we found that if we changed that model, in other words, we replaced income in the waiting with education, the numbers were pretty much the same. Um, Most of these contests are very close. Um, In Missouri, uh, we really didn't see um, anything. Um, The release data was we had McCaskill um, 47 and Hawley 47, that's the Democrat, the Republican. And then uh, when we waited by education, um, it was McCaskill 40 and Hawley 47, statistically no different. Certainly editorially, if you want to say, you know, the Republican Mm -hmm. has nudged, um, you know, up a point, but statistically nothing. 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 Um, In Tennessee, um, we had the Democrat in our released results at 48. um, Weighted by... Income. Weighted by income, yep. a, a, along with the other factors that we do we do weight by as well, and uh, the Republican forty six. So it was plus um, Democrat by two. Weighting by education, we had um, the it was plus Republican two, um, and then let's see um, in, in Indiana. In, in Indiana, you know, the Senate um, race it, there. Yes, we um, we looked at the Senate race there. Uh, the Donnelly, the Democrat, was 44 to the Republicans, 41, um, and then we waited by education. Um, Donnelly's um, uh, support was 43, and Braun's didn't. Uh, the Republicans did not did not move um, at, so, at all. So the issue then becomes to those who say, "But you didn't wait by education." We would say. No, and we wouldn't, and we shouldn't, because it didn't make. You a can. You can. You, you but can. It do it. Um, we wait by income. Um, we we um, also see that when we wait by uh, income internally, the other numbers, not just the toss up, don't vary as much. So, for instance, even when you saw these couple of points um, that it did move Republican one way or the other, it does change the demography overall uh, of the sample slightly. And so that's really the reason um, that that you see that. And so it makes it. Um, especially in places where we have registration, so we know that we have a certain um, proportion of Democrats and a certain proportion of Republicans, we see that it simply just pulls it a little bit more um, Republican, but not necessarily because it is so. If if that makes if that makes, makes sense. A lot. Well, look, um, I know it's a epi- little hard to explain. This is episode sixty three. We've been educating the. <laughs> we've been going down the wonky path on many occasions. This we really went down. We went down the wonky throughway on this one. But I might say, you know, we just had parents weekend, a family weekend at Marist, and we had lots and lots of parents in our survey room. Oh, and, and grandparents, grandparents and aunts and uncles and husbands and wives. Yeah, it was packed. And, and, and some standing her moment, and literally. And some there are. Older students. Who, yep, and who, former pollsters from way back in earlier. And you know, I was fascinated. We did our presentation as we do every year. And what was really interesting to me was that the questions people asked us weren't about, well, who's going to win the House and who's yeah, going to win nothing. the Senate. Almost none of them. It was all this. about how you do, you know, how the sausage is made and, you know, what are the ingredients literally that go into doing a poll. So I feel that, you know, Maybe sometimes when we go wonky, we're actually hitting what people really have on their minds. Well, you know, I just did want to say one other thing, though, on this on this issue of education, which you had said you had talked about, Lee, and the fact that when you're looking at uh, your data after an election, 
um, and you're trying to now fit the data back to what you know is real, uh, it can tout you somewhat in the wrong direction. And I think this issue of education, I think the jury's still out. I think we need to see um, whether it does improve estimates. Um, for 2016, it improved some estimates in some states and didn't in others, which suggests that there may be more going on in the methods um, of those polls if you don't see that consistency across all of the polling. So we're going to keep asking the question, and the best news is that when we have actual results, meaning after Election Day, when you actually know where your polls stand up, we're going to be able to, to look at this in a really hard way and say, did education do better than income or income to education? Is it 2016 all over again? We'll be able to answer those questions. That's going to do it for this edition of Poll Hub. Poll Hub is a production of the Marist Poll at Marist College in Poughkeepsie, New York. And thanks to Mary Griffith, our executive producer, who always organizes us or tries to organize us. I think Herding we're like, cats. took the words right out of my mouth. And of course, thanks also to Kenny Marbles. New, new Jersey's own. Every time we said the word New Jersey, I mean, he smiled. Kind of, oh, it was, oh, it was <laughs> jumping up and down. I mean, it was like you know, sending off flares. I mean, He's our really editor and uh, we Ridiculous. also have our intern with us uh, today, uh, Ashley. So thank you very much for uh, for hanging in there with us. And we'd also like to thank, as I did earlier during the, the program. In context. Yes, that was actually, good, in yeah. context. I went, I went when we were talking about the Thomas Hill controversy, but the Roper Center at uh, Archives at Cornell, and they provide us with all this trend data so we could dip back in time. In that case, look at 1991 and see whether things are similar or whether they've changed. And, so that's a great help. And you don't have to be a parent of a Marist student to ask us questions. You can do so by sending us an email at pollhub at marist.edu, or you can reach out on social media. We monitor it at all times, 24-7, at Marist Poll on Twitter, Marist Poll on Facebook, and we'll answer your questions there or here on the podcast. And look at the device you're listening to this on. I say it every week. There's a button that says subscribe. Tap it, and then you will get an indication when the latest issue of Poll Hub is released. It'll be episode 64 next week. We're getting close to retirement. I mean, the retirement age, but we're not going anyplace. <laughs>